Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Traders Summit, and with me today I have Mish from Market Gauge. How are you, Mish? How 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 have you been? Been great. Thanks, Blake, for having me on today. It's so nice to have you here. So you know the reason I really wanted to bring you on is a couple couplefold, really. You know the market's been grinding higher, and we have seemed to find a lot of support here in the S and P around the forty four fifty level. How are you approaching the market? right now, especially with the Fed coming up this next week? Well, it's interesting because there's a couple of places to be watching in the market. There's this huge dichotomy between the S&P 500 as the index and a lot of the stocks that are actually traded within the basket. Those, some of those have really been going down while the index has been going up. So the fact that we're seeing a little bit maybe of that gap narrowing where maybe we'll start to see some of the value stocks come into play would be a lot healthier for the market while the index comes down. But let's put that on the side. What I really like to focus on all the time, even though NASDAQ and S&P have well outperformed, I still really watch the small caps. Okay. The Russell 2000 in particular as the key index for me. And that is because it is really tied to the growth of the US economy because those 2000 stocks that are in the basket of IWM are not only heavy in the financials, which has been a weak sector, but also heavy in manufacturing and industrial and all with a presence here in the US, as opposed to your Apples and your Microsofts and your Amazon that are more tech oriented. The other thing I really like to watch is the transportation sector. And I like to look at that through the ETF IYT, because that sort of, if we look at, at the IWM or the Russells as your supply side, then IYT or transportation is really going to be your demand side, right? Yeah. And so if you want to see a clue into not only how things are doing in terms of output, but if you really want to see how much people are buying or traveling, you're going to look there. So that's your trains, planes, automobiles, I like to call it. Yeah. And that started going down well before, well, actually hasn't even really gone up much, but it was definitely going down while the queues were going sideways and while the spy was sort of sort of hanging out near the highs until these last several days. So that already told me to, to spell some caution here that tech will eventually, gravity will always take over. And what you're hearing people say is the spy hasn't even had a real good correction in so long. So we kind of liquidated in terms of the discretionary trading account, we liquidated a lot of the stuff that just wasn't working. It wasn't really going anywhere. It wasn't like we were underwater, but we weren't really making money. So just to be defensive, we unloaded probably about seven positions last wow. week. Okay. Held on to natural gas, which we can talk about commodities in a little bit. Netflix, which we got out of earlier this week. And a couple of other smaller uh, equities that are still in there from ages ago. But now today is a very pivotal day. So let's get back to the Fed. So right now, the Fed is watching the exact same thing we're watching. They're pretty smart, even though everybody likes to criticize them and says, <laughs> oh, inflation, inflation, inflation. And yes, they're letting it run hot. CPI actually showed it cooled. You know, I'm skeptical about that. But in terms of pure numbers, they're going to stay accommodative. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in the junk bonds. We're seeing that in the, in the treasury bonds, which are showing how they're a little bit concerned here about the overall economy growing. And so what that tells me is that the big crash that people are anticipating is not going to happen and we're more range bound. Well, that, you know, and that's interesting you say being range bound because you, you talk about like the Russell 2000, you look at all of 2021, I mean, the market really hasn't gone anywhere and we happen to be pretty much mid-range. But then you mentioned the, the 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 transports and you're right, they have been underperforming. Actually, I think we were at least at the 2021 lows or really close to the 2021 lows. And it looks like we're holding so that that range bound theory um, is going to is, is, you know, it seems like that's that's what's in play right now. So what would what would change your mind if, if you know, let's let's fast forward to the Fed. And here we are on the 22nd. And uh, the Fed says what that might say, you know what, I need to be all in. I need to be long everything. Or is there something that might trigger you to say, you know what, I need to stand aside and let the market pull back a little bit. What, what are your thoughts there? 
That's a great question, Blake, because that is exactly my strategy here is to watch over the next few days. I'm pretty convinced that the Fed is going to say exactly what they always say. The labor market is weak. And the labor market is going to remain weak. And the reason why is because even though the unemployment benefits have gone away, there are millions and millions of people who are taking early retirement. There's still a whole lot of people that aren't going back to work. And you also have these incentive bonuses that people are signing up for and then quitting the next day. So people have not only learned to game this whole system, but on top of that, people are worried about the variant. A lot of companies have said you can stay at home. People have found other businesses and people are investing. So yeah. all of that, I don't know if, the, if you know, you're going to sit there, Powell's going to say all of that, but he's going to say labor market is weak and he needs to see it stronger. He's made that clear. That and what we just talked about, these inside sectors are weak, showing growth, maybe not so much. So they're going to stay where they're at. Taper, people are confused. Taper means they're going to maybe buy less bonds, but they just announced ahead of the debt ceiling that they're actually going to buy more bonds. So let's put the Fed out of the equation for a second and look at pure chart. So here's what I'm watching. Just like you just said, in IYT transports in particular, we just tested actually the July 2021 lows. And in the Russells, we're still well above the, the 2021 lows because they were like down at around 204. It's trading like 221, really struggling here to hang on. Yeah. I think you need to have some patience. If those two areas in particular hold these support levels and start to creep up, even if it's ahead of the Fed meeting, if you're going to trade on the basis of every Fed meeting, you'd be crippled. You would have never made any money. So if you if you want to look at certain things based on risk reward, particularly in the small caps or in the transports that are well undervalued with good risk, if they hold, yeah, that's kind of our strategy. I'm still very much focused on commodities. And I still think that gold is ridiculously undervalued. Uh, the grains had all come off, giving a buy opportunity here, particularly wheat today's start to fly again. And so put the commodities aside, what would make me go super defensive would be is if those areas we just talked about fail. If right. transports can hold around 242, which is a 50 week moving average. If IWM breaks down under, let's say, I would even give it some room, 214, 204, um, and then the queues start to lose it and the spy starts to lose the 50 day moving average. That would happen as well. I'd also watch volatility because when we've had these moves down, we haven't seen volatility move very much. Yeah. So if the volatility starts to increase and these sectors really continue to weaken, even if the Fed becomes more accommodative or says they're going to remain as accommodative, then I think we've got some trouble ahead. But right now, I'm not anticipating that very much. Well, very good. You know, Michelle, I, I, I love how you put together all the different sectors and I love how you like to factor in some commodities there too. And, you know, I've had a lot of one, one last thing I want to, I want to mention just before I let you go, you know, a lot of people pretty much universally across the board that I talk to really love gold. And I understand the reasons why, but we haven't seen gold really do much. And it hasn't done much in the face of higher inflationary pressures that we've seen you know, this year. So is there any place that you're looking in gold that you might say, I don't know if I really want to own it anymore? Because I like you, I, I, I get the story and I like the story and it, it should be going higher, but it's, it's having a difficult time. Where is it where you go, eh, I don't know if I really want to own it anymore? Do you know right off the top oh. of your head? I know it's a, I, yeah, no, no, I have it off the top of my head. Okay. I'm just trying to think if I should talk in terms of futures prices, like price per ounce, or ter yeah. talk in terms of GLD or both. Oh, you so can, let's say, yeah, so let's look at futures prices. So we're hovering okay. around 1800. Roughly, we've yeah. gone down. I, I, I felt the buy zone was going to be somewhere around 1790. And so far, we're holding around that 1790 mark. If it breaks down under 1790, I wouldn't necessarily be the dip buyer right away because we could see another flush down. 1750, though, would really be like my rock bottom. I, I, I can't even imagine, Blake, that it's going to go down much lower than that. I really can't. On the flip side, if we look at GLD, then we're looking at around 164.50 is really kind of what I think would correspond with around that 1750, maybe a little higher. I don't know if the exact ratio there. On the other side, we have a six month calendar range, which we like to look at. It resets every January and every July. So we just had a reset. 
And that recent spike we had in GLD at 171 and change was yeah. right to the top of the six month calendar range high. And that equated to about 1834 an ounce. We get through there, even though selling strength has been the ticket in gold, I think that gold will really start to rally. And yes, inflation is a key. And there's been other indicators that people have looked at to hedge like Bitcoin, for example. Yeah. But it also has a geopolitical component. And so if there's any unrest that happens, and let's face it, things seem to be relatively orderly, all things considered, but there's buzzes out there. And I've heard them, this Afghanistan situation, I've heard buzzes about Al-Qaeda trying to get their act together. Anything that could happen geopolitically could take gold rocketing. And even if that doesn't happen, and of course, we all hope that nothing happens, it still is so undervalued compared to the Dow. If you look at 1980, we are at about a 35 to one in terms of price ratio between the Dow and the gold where they were in 1980 to 2021. So that tells me that it's bubbling. It's bubbling. And I still, it's gold. It's still valuable. It's still a store of value. It's not like it's worthless. So that's kind of where I have my eye at this point. Well, you know, Michelle, that was, uh, I, I love I love it because, you know, I like you, it's like, man, I know above 1835, I'm probably going to let loose. It's a big resistance for the, for the gold market. So that's great. You know, Mish, if, 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 if I want to learn more about what you do, how do I find you specifically? Well, Twitter is probably the best place. Um, and my handle is at market minute. Uh, I also, marketgauge.com is our website, but I'm very, very uh, responsive on Twitter. So if you have a specific question, you can ask me there and we can always take it from that point. But Market Gauge would be fun to look at just to see what we do, our suite of products, how we operate, our free content, as well as our paid content. Awesome. And you know, traders, for those of you that are listening in from the Traders Summit website, just click the link below. It'll take you right to, to Mish's website. And Mish and her team post pretty much daily here on the Trader Summit site. So you can always get fresh ideas right from them. So Michelle Snyder, thank you so much for joining us today. And it's always great seeing you. Thank you so much, Blake. Pleasure.